Good morning, Harvest. I hope you're getting to enjoy some of this great summer weather. Most of you will know this is my favorite time of year. The hotter, the better. I just love the sunshine. I love being outside. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Karen Brink, who knocked it out of the park last week. Wow. If you weren't able to get that message, you want to download it and have a look at it. As she completed the series of Dangerous Prayers, Send Me. She alluded in the story of how God sent her to Cornwall for this season of time. And I not only want to give her a shout out for the great job that she did in presenting the word to us, but the production quality that we're enjoying as a church, that God would bring that gift here to Cornwall. And I just need to say, if you look at what she's producing for our church, for your enjoyment, for mine, for my edification, for your edification, you'll see that it is just top-notch, really a professional, professional job. So we want to just say thank you, Karen, for all that you do here at Harvest. Well, we are in our summer reading series, and as I said, we just finished Dangerous Prayers, and we're beginning Enemies of the Heart. Now, you might kind of want to know, or maybe you've asked, why would we do a summer reading series? Why would we look at two books? Uh, Don't we read the Bible anymore at Harvest? And of course we do. These are not only two great authors and uh, two great leaders. These are two great pastors. And their books really allow us to drill down and get really intentional about some biblical content. And specifically, as we're believing that God has spoken to us and getting us ready for September, and he wants to do something new, he wants to do something fresh for us, that's kind of the sense. And he just said, get ready for that. And as we get ready for that, we really felt to get ready at a heart, at a heart level. And so these books really allow us to get inattentional, get inattentionally into our heart and pray that very first prayer that we learned in Dangerous Prayer, search, search my heart. Uh, you're going to see that the books really complement one another. And, um, and today what I want to do is bridge the series Dangerous Prayers into Enemies of the Heart. And so if you're wondering today, which series are we in? We're in both. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you're doing in each of our lives, in the middle of the difficulty of COVID. I personally, Lord, you know, as I've poured my heart out to you, I've struggled with this time. You've been so faithful and so good and so precious to me. Lord, I pray that you will just touch every person that's watching right now. Bless every person that might be listening throughout the week. Lord, touch us today as we prepare our hearts Lord, for all that you have for us, not just in September, but for all the days ahead, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, yeah, come on, amen. I remember the first time I met Christina, and for those of you that might be new, that's my my wife, Christina, and we were in a, actually in a church service, and um, I had not met her or even seen her before. But our church used to do this, what I thought was like hugely awkward activity after worship, And that would be that we would turn around, get into groups of six or seven, and uh, we would would pray for each other. Take a moment just to kind of go around the circle. Do you have any prayer requests? And then we would pray them. And uh, on this particular Sunday, I turned around and wow, there, (laughs) there she was. And I have to admit, like I really remember that moment. I was instantly smitten by her, by her great looks, uh, by her smile that is just contagious and just the life that exuded from her. And uh, at that moment, I just, I was, I was smitten. And uh, I didn't think it was so awkward on that particular Sunday that we got to pray. And there was even like a higher notch up awkward part of this. And that was that you would hold hands with the people that you would pray with. And on this particular Sunday, she was going to be my prayer hand holding partner to my left. (laughs) And that was awesome. And I don't even know who was on my right. I don't remember. I don't really care. But but I, she was on. She was on uh, on my left uh, that particular day. And um, afterwards, I I asked her her name, and she told me. Uh, and uh, and and so I wanted to ask her out on a date. And so I made sure that I was in the next service uh, that she was in. And I approached her and, and I said to her, would you go out for pizza with me and, and just grab a, a slice of pizza and we'll go to a restaurant? And she said, 
Yes. <laughs> and I said, what, what, really? <laughs> I was actually surprised by her yes. And our relationship began to grow with a series. There were no's, of course, in our relationship, but, but I, wanna, I wanna really make the point of the yes of relationship. There were a series of yeses, choosers, our yes, our chooser that says yes to another person. And we had a series of those until I remember the day, uh, and it, our, we have our actually our engagement anniversary, and our wedding anniversary, same day, August the 6th. And in 1982, I asked Christine, I said, I wanna spend the rest of my life with you. Would you marry me? And she said, yes. I was like, what, really? <laughs> and then a year later, uh, we would formalize that in a, in, a, in a marriage ceremony where she would say yes and pledge her love to me. Now, the reason I share the story with you is I want you to understand that, that life relationships are built when we choose another, when one extends love or we extend love to another and that other person says yes to our love and receives and accepts that love and relationship is built and God created it that way. In fact, that's the way it begins in the heart of God. And that God so loved the world that he extended his son, Jesus. Jesus extended his life to us. And we can say yes or no to God's love. Now, I want you to think about this. Because the gift, and it is a gift, our chooser, our free will is a gift from God. And that chooser, that free will, capacity to choose God and respond yes to his love is not only a gift to us. Now, when you think about this, it's probably the greatest risk that God ever took. The risk being that there would be people, human beings, that would say no to God because they had that choice. They could say yes or they could say no. We can say yes or we can say no to God. God's given us that gift, but think of the risk from God's perspective of giving humanity that choice and that there would be some who would choose, no, God, I don't want to say yes to you. I, I can't imagine that, imagine that. And, and today, perhaps you can't imagine that, but there are people who have and will say no to God. And I'd like to say it this way, that it is free will is the greatest risk that love took God being love, God is love. The, God doesn't have love, God is love, according to 1 John. Love finds its source in the essence of, of who God is. That giving us that gift was the greatest risk that love took. In order that the relationship that we would have with God would be legitimate, it would be authentic, it would be real. Because think about it, if God just created us to be robots, that God just created us, that we had no choice other than to love him or other than would really be love then, would it? Because love has to be a choice. Then really just then other than to serve him. I think that's called slavery. <laughs> and so God didn't create us that way. God created us having the choice of relationship. And I'm going somewhere with this. And it's really important. That gift that God gave you and that gift that God gave me is the essence of dangerous prayers. It's really what we were after. Because in the prayers, search me, break me, send me, in those prayers, you were giving God permission to come into your heart in a new way. You were giving God more capacity uh, 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 of being able to occupy your heart. You see, God will not mess with your life. God will not come into the most private area of your life, your heart, unless you give him permission, unless you say yes. You see, the devil operates very differently. The devil trumps us all over our lives. He manipulates. He uses control and shame and fear. He uses so many tactics as he approaches uh, humanity because he doesn't care about relationship. He just wants to kill and rob and destroy, the Bible says. But God comes that we might have life and have it to the full. And that full life begins in our relationship with God. And so God wants permission. In fact, he will not touch areas of your heart unless he has your yes. 
And so from the very beginning of relationship with God, he knocks at the door of our life. He wants uh, permission into more areas of your heart. And so in dangerous person, we gave God permission. We gave him more of our hearts. Lord, search me and know my heart. God, break me. Make sure there is nothing walling me up. Break all of the walls of my life that my life could be released to its greatest capacity and then send me, Lord, I trust you. In fact, really what we were praying in search me, break me, send me, was responding to God, I love you too. And because I love you, I'm learning to trust you. And because I trust you, here's my heart. And that was the essence of dangerous prayers. Now we want to move on from that. Because now we want to get intentional about some of the stuff that God's going to show us that's in our heart, the enemies of our heart. I'd like to kind of land on a verse here that David's gonna help us with in Psalm chapter 51, verse 10, to kind of bring some understanding and some meaning uh, to this whole idea of God now looking into our hearts as we say yes to him. God, yes, have my heart. David had, had um, in Psalm 51, he's penning, uh, where he's coming from as he's made some hugely bad choices in his life that included uh, an illicit affair, that included murder, that included really every sin that you can list. And, and David's heart is turning back to God for forgiveness. And it's turning back to God for acceptance. And it's turning back to God to be made whole. And as David does that, he pens this prayer. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And I want you to see two words, create and renew. And most theologians, as they help us understand this verse, understand that this verse is probably the clearest wording of what happens, David being in the, in the Old Testament, looking in faith and prophetically into the New Testament where you and I live, of what happens in the new birth or what we call being born again. When God, God himself puts his spirit into our lives. When I was a little kid, it was explained this way. Bow your hearts. We would be in, in, a, in, a, in a kid's church context. Everybody bow your hearts. We're going to ask Jesus into our heart. And uh, there would be a picture of Jesus knocking on the door of our heart. There would be a door. And somehow we understood that there was a door on our heart inside of us, way inside somewhere. And Jesus would come in, and we would invite Jesus into our lives. Well, uh, it's a little kid's understanding, but theologically, that's kind of what's happening. And David says, he asks God, he says, God, would you give me something brand new? God, something that I've never had before. He's not asking for something to be fixed or repaired, at least not yet. He's asking for a clean heart, a new heart, a heart that would be a blank slate before God. In fact, that word create is the same word that we find in Genesis, that God created the heavens and the earth. And as you look at the Genesis story, that God created something out of nothing. And however this worked, it also says that there was chaotic madness in the universe whatever the universe was, it was in this chaotic madness that God brought order to when God spoke across whatever the universe then was and created something out of nothing. These two components, something out of nothing and order into chaotic madness. <laughs> and so only God could create. It's what makes him God. David says, create in me a brand new heart and renew when God comes into our life, he literally creates a brand new heart. He puts his spirit into our lives. In fact, the Bible says that it's a mystery, but the two of us become one. In other words, that God gives the human heart, the human being, you and I, the capacity to be so close to God that we wouldn't, we wouldn't see two, we would see one. Wow, think about that for a minute. That's the relationship he wants you to have with him. It's the relationship he wants me to have with him. That it would be indis indistinguishable. That there would be two and not one. David goes on 
He's creating me a clean heart. And that's what happens when we're born again. And then he says, renew a steadfast spirit in me. And that word renew means to, to build. It, it means to repair. It means to refresh. And David understood that even if God were to give him something brand new, his life experience has still imprinted him. And it has trodden down on his life and hardened his heart. And that the human spirit needs to be repaired and restored. It needs to be refreshed. And I don't know about you, but I, I'm asking God, would you restore me even more? Repair me even more? Refresh me even more? And when you say yes to God, you're saying yes, the initial yes of this relationship with God. But then it goes on to say yes, Lord, as I give you my heart that's been broken, my heart heart that's been torn, my heart that's been trodden down, my heart that's lived, whether it's five seconds or like me in a couple of weeks, 57 years in, 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 this, in this world that doesn't work right, this world where I have sinned and I've been sinned against, my human spirit needs to be repaired. It needs to be healed. It needs to be refreshed. Psalm 103 verse 5 says it this way in the message version, he wraps you in goodness. <laughs> He's talking about his arms, his love, his relationship, beauty eternal. He renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. What's, what's David saying? that in the presence of God, in this relationship, this capacity he's given me, as I have this clean heart, his spirit in me, now moves forward that the human spirit that has been broken and trodden upon and has been aged by the experience of this life, again, whether you're five seconds old or 57 years old, it doesn't matter. We're born with a heart, the human heart that's broken this way. He renews it. He repairs it. He brings refreshing to it. All of us have had our hearts wounded. All of us have experienced the pain of living this human life that's affected us. And here's the reality. <laughs> here's the reality. At least it's my reality. And as your pastor, I want you to consider it's absolutely your reality too. We have no capacity to monitor our hearts. We have no capacity. That was part of dangerous prayers. Part one is I explained that the heart is deceitful and it's, it's wicked beyond knowing. And it's, it's, it's just even, we've lied to ourselves. We don't have the capacity to monitor our, our heart. I, I remember a number of years ago, we were uh, beginning here in Cornwall and, and starting this, this really amazing church that God has, has brought to life here in Cornwall and, and given me the privilege to be a part of. And if you've been around, you understand just the great, great house of God that's being built here in Cornwall. But we spent years, uh, it felt like, I, I describe it this way, I felt like I had a sledgehammer and I was whacking it on a, a tremendous boulder expecting it to split open. We call it breakthrough. <laughs> And we were looking for this region to break open to the gospel and break open the gospel penetration. We weren't seeing a lot of results. And at times, I just, you know, being honest, uh, um, it was hard. And it was, it was hard especially <laughs> when I would get with other pastors. And whether they were from this region or another region, it didn't matter. But often would be the case they would be celebrating their breakthroughs, celebrating growth, celebrating their amazing staff, celebrating all that God was doing. And um, outwardly, I would say, wow, praise God, you the man, God's using you. Look at your gift and calling coming to fulfillment. Look at your church, wow. And on the inside, I was dying. On the inside, my voice inside was going, no way, you're lying. It can't be that good. There's no way. We're working so hard in Cornwall. You're exaggerating. You're lying. It's not going that great. Shut up. I don't even want to hear what you're saying right now. <laughs> and somehow, you know, I would filter that, but I was realizing something was bubbling up from the inside. And I would say things like, where'd that come from? <laughs> Have you ever had one of those, where did that come from moments? We've all had where that, where, where does that come from moment. Think about uh, a story. You know, it might be your story. It may not be your story. It's just a story today. The names of the characters have been changed to protect the innocent. Two girls growing up in, in the same home. 
And um, these little girls, as they grow up together, sisters, um, one has a body metabolism that just burns up everything. Like no matter what she eats, she's going to be a supermodel. The other one, not so much. And is more weight conscious, is, is more aware as she grows through life and, and gets feedback from other human beings that her body style is different. And she's really self-aware of that. In fact, um, has that really inappropriate uncle that comes over for a visit that thinks it's funny to say to the one sister, wow, you know, you look like a gymnast today. And to the sister that's struggling a little bit makes a joke about the donut that she's holding. Yeah, I know, too real for somebody that's listening today, but follow me because this is super important. And as you fast forward into adulthood, maybe right now today, and let's say you're that person that struggled and was the recipient of some teasing, a recipient, no, a whole lot of teasing, and a recipient of a, of a self-awareness that you're not comfortable with because you were compared to somebody else. Maybe somebody that you wanted to love deeply and you know you should love deeply, but there was some animosity to begin to grow. And so, so you get together with some friends this week or next week or last week out on a patio that you have not seen because of COVID. And one of your friends that has worked, used the COVID time to work really hard to diet and, and, and just like build this beach body and shows up looking fine. And you know, like it's your friend and you're like, wow, you look amazing. That's what you're thinking. But inside, you can't say it. Something inside is, I hate you right now. Why do you look so good right now? Now you filter that because you know that's not good behavior. But you get home, you go, where's that coming from? <laughs> I'm going somewhere. Stay with me now. I've got five boys. And... Um, and, you know, uh, what we did, and probably unknowingly as parents, but we passed toys all the way down through our five boys. In fact, we have totes in our house of, uh, we had boys, so toys for boys um, that, you know, boys would tend to, I got granddaughters, they play with them too, but toys that bo our boys really enjoyed and, and, and uh, really, really liked. And they're still today in these totes. But the fact is that if you were, you know, down the line, you didn't always get the newer toys. The newer toys kind of started at the beginning and worked their way down through. And so even though the toys were in good condition and they're, as they say, you know, I can justify all this they exist today, some of our boys got hand-me-downs. Now fast forward into adult life. And let's just say one of my boys uh, is, gets a phone call from one of his buds and says, hey, I, I, I want to come over and show you something. Can I come over? And so he does. And he pulls up in a brand new car. I mean, brand spanking new. Like the kilometers, it's like four. <laughs> because he drove from the dealership to one of my son's houses. Uh, this is a made-up story, but uh, just follow with me here. And, and so one of my sons who has had hand-me-downs his whole life goes out and recognizes this is a brand new car, smells brand new car, looks at the odometer, and on the outside behaves properly with his friend, but on the inside is screaming, well, who does this? Who drives her stupid brand new car over to my house? I don't want to see your stupid car. Are you like bragging or something? What's going on here, dude? And the car drives away. Where did that come from? Well, I need to talk to you about the problem of where did that come from? It comes from our heart. And the reality of the uprisings of some of these attitudes is that a lot of times in our lives, we can filter it. But many times when our guards are down, and our guards will come down through crises, our guards have come down during COVID, our guards, our guarded hearts um, will kind of be exposed during times where we're with the people we love the most because that's how God made us actually, was not to be walled up or guarded with people we love. But unfortunately, it's there that the enemies of the heart ugh, come out and they affect our relationships in very negative ways. They affect our relationship with God in negative ways. They, reflect, we, 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 they, they cause problems in our relationships with the people around us. 
And so, so what God is after, that his love and saying yes and love, as we say, create in me, yes, God, I want to have a relationship with you. He takes it a second part now in the prayer. And we're going to say, God, renew, repair, restore. I'm taking the walls down. I'm putting my heart into your hands. Would you help me identify the enemies of my heart? And we're going to look for four of them. Andy Stanley, in this great book, has identified really in the root system of, of humanity guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. It's hard to say them, isn't it? <laughs> it's even hard to say it. What we're going to learn is that many of us have years, a lifetime, of heart damage. And so these aren't things that are going to change overnight. Read the book and we're, you know, presto, magico, we're changed. But we're going to begin a process of learning to give God our heart in a way that these enemies are being identified. And the work of these enemies, whether we've agreed to the work or the work's been done to us, it doesn't matter. It works both ways. That our hearts would be changed and these enemies would be rooted out and sent out of our hearts. And it allows God to begin shining the light into, into our lives. We're going to spend a week on each enemy. And what we're going to learn is that each of these enemies works on a debt-to-debtor dynamic. And it's really important you understand this before we kind of jump into guilt next week. Um, and I do encourage you to get the book if you haven't ordered it already. And um, uh, many people I've talked to didn't know that you can use your iPhone as a Kindle device and just download from Amazon right into your phone or into an iPad and read it. That's how I read most of my books. And as we look at, uh, we look at these enemies, the debt-to-debtor dynamic, um, and here's what I mean. So guilt. Guilt is an enemy that says, makes you say um, that I owe you. Or it causes you to live your life out of guilt. So you, you feel guilty about everything. In fact, some of you are parenting out of guilt. Some of you live your life out of guilt. And guilt is, I owe you. Come on, you said this. I owe my kids a better life than I had. I'm letting that one just hit home. <laughs> I owe my kids. So there could be an enemy in your heart, that debt to debtor dynamic, where you're literally living in relationship with your children, feeling like you owe them something, or you feel guilted um, in your relationships. And so you're going to learn how to identify that and begin to get the tools uh, to understand guilt. Anger, you owe me. Anger at its root system is a, an emotional response that isn't bad, but it can become bad when it's left unchecked. Anger is a dashboard indicator that says something's been taken away from you. When something's been taken from you that is yours, belongs to you, and it's taken inappropriately, anger is the response that tells you this is wrong. And so anger is, you owe me. Well, many of us live angry. We go around life angry because something's been taken from us and we don't know how to deal with this feeling that everybody is taking, 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 and I'm angry about it. You owe me. Greed. I owe me. <laughs> that somehow in my life, and through uh, uh, life treating me, which, you know, however life has treated me, but, but the, the message that life sent me was no matter what, I will never have. I will never have my needs met. I will never have a fulfilled relationship. I will never have a good job. I will never, 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 never. I will never have enough. I can't get full. I will never be filled. And so the root of that is the enemy greed that says, I owe me. I owe me. And so I'm going to live my life trying to fill up the empty boxes and buckets of my life on an endless journey that will never fill me at all. The last one, jealousy. God owes me or the universe owes me or this life owes me. I didn't get, I didn't get a life dealt to me like so-and-so or to so-and-so. And I'm not blessed like so-and-so. Have you ever had a, where God's blessed somebody else and you're feeling like, why isn't God blessing me? And it rises up. Jealousy is that God owes me, that God hasn't come through for me, that God hasn't given to me. 
These are debts that many of us are living with, debt to debt, a relationship. And the only way we can get free from these enemies is either to have it paid in full or to have the debt canceled. And I want you to learn how to deal with the enemies of the heart. But it starts with creating me a clean heart, dangerous prayers. God, I want to give you my heart and my life. I want to trust you. I want to love you. Love you too, God. But then it gets practical. I trust you. Now here's my heart. And would you begin to shine a light on it? Creating me a clean heart and restore right spirit. Begin to do a deeper work in my life and change me, God, from the inside out. I want to leave you with a promise today because if I leave you with the four enemies, we're like, oh yeah, I know what that's about. I want you to be more aware of God's love and God's life-changing power called grace in all of our lives as we say yes to him in this season. It's found in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. And it's God's response to create in me, not literally, he's not responding to David, but it's another verse in another part of the Bible that so adequately answers you and I saying, God, create in me a clean heart. And God, would you take it a step further and now restore, repair what the human life has done to me. And I want to be changed from the inside out. God says, and I will give you a new heart. The capacity to love like God. The capacity to have a relationship with God. And to carry that into our lives. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. Oh, come on. Life has trumped all over you and I. Life's experiences, whether you're five minutes old or 57, life creates a heart that's hard and stony. And God's saying, I want to change it. I don't want you filtering. I want you to live in a way that the walls can come down. Come on, you said like me, I don't want to do this relationship thing anymore. I've been hurt too many times. I'm done. (laughs) And God wants us to learn not to live in the limitations, but in the limitless capacity of what it is to have a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. I'm not a robot. I'm not destined to serve God out of a capacity of I have to. It's a promise that says, I will change you and we will walk in this life together the way you've never imagined. Come on, bow your heads and your hearts with me right now, wherever you are watching this. Lord, I thank you for this promise. I am so aware, Lord, that my heart doesn't work the way it should. But I want my heart to work even greater in my relationship with Christina. I want my heart to work with those people that I'm doing life with. I, as a pastor, I want my heart to work even better than it works uh, up, up until this point. And the only way I know that my heart can work better as Lord, as you continue to soften it, as you continue to make it more responsive. And Lord, the only way that I know that my heart can work the way it should, in alignment with you, in alignment with your heart, is for me to trust you and love you enough to say, Lord, here it is. I trust you with my heart, my innermost person, my secrets, my fears, the things that have been hidden, but I bring them to light and I ask you, search me and know me and change me from the inside out. According to this promise in Ezekiel today, I pray for all of us and for me included in Jesus' name today. And we all said, amen. God bless you. Have an amazing week.